It's hard to imagine a worse human being than Pedro Alonso Lopez. It's hard to even think of him as being a human being. The monster of the Andes is one of the most prolific serial killers, child rapists, and child murderers in history. The worst of the worst. When he was captured for trying to lure a local street vendor's young daughter away from her family in Ecuador in 1980, local authorities suspected him for the murder of four other girls whose bodies they just recently uncovered. Police were blown away when he confessed to not only those murders, but the murders of a total of 110 little girls in Ecuador alone. He'd also been busy in Peru and Colombia. The number was so outrageous, authorities thought he was lying. But when Pedro led them to the bodies of 53 girls, they certainly believed him then. And the 110 victims may just be the tip of the iceberg. All in all, authorities suspect Pedro Lopez of killing over 350 girls between his native Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador in the mid to late 70s. After he was convicted of the murder of 57 girls in Ecuador in 1983, he was given the maximum sentence allowed for any crime in that country, 16 years in prison. Yeah, confessed to 110 murders, led police to 53 grave sites, found guilty in court of 57 murders, all the killings they had recovered bodies for, and he was sentenced to only 16 years. And then he'd be released two years early for good behavior. And after his release, he would be immediately detained again, deported to Colombia, and imprisoned in a psychiatric hospital for additional crimes there, only to again be set free after just a few years, this time set free for good. Pedro Alonso Lopez's whereabouts have been unknown since 1998. He may still be alive. He may still be killing. Colombian authorities have suspected him of additional murders since 2002. Who is this monster? Why does he do what he does? How does someone become so cold, so vicious? How is he able to kill so many children before getting caught? Why was he ever allowed to be freed? In 16 years? That's it? What's the story behind Ecuador's criminal justice system? We travel to South America today, revisit Colombia for the first time since we talked about Pablo Escobar. Pablo and Pedro were born a year apart, actually, and both grew up in extreme poverty in Colombia. And both chose to exploit the broken criminal justice system of Colombia and northwestern South America in general in the 1960s and 1970s for their own selfish ends, but in very, very different ways. As bad as Pablo Escobar was, and he was a very bad dude, Pedro was, in my opinion, so much worse. If I had to pick either him or Pedro to babysit my kids, uh, I'm sure as hell going to go with Escobar. You could argue that Pablo at least tried to help the poor, tried to help some people, even if he fueled a cocaine epidemic that led to countless deaths and destroyed lives. Pedro caused only pain. It's a bummer that Escobar never met Pedro Lopez in the 1970s. I'd like to think he would have had him tortured and killed. Pedro murdered little girls from the same impoverished neighborhoods Pablo at least tried to help in his own misguided ways. So get ready for a dark, true crime suck today. Another example of why certain sexually violent people may need to be put on that island we talked about last week, or perhaps just removed from the planet entirely. Work can wait. It's time for Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Hooray for Monday. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray! For time such a jolly good fellow, for time such a jolly good fellow, for time such a jolly good fellow! Even we talk about super dark shit like we do today. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah! Uh, thanks to our space lizards supporting the show via Patreon for allowing this show to continue and for coming out to support the Happy Murder Tour stand-up shows as well. Meeting more and more space lizards on the road. Had a blast in Philly. Got some more cool gifts to adorn the walls of the Suck Dungeon as well. And thanks for all the brave, courageous messages from the victims of sexual abuse this past week. Holy shit. Glad the episode helped reinforce the message that it is not your fault when you are victimized. Fuck those assholes who took advantage of and abused you. May they rot in Nimrod's hellish butthole forever and ever. Amen. Uh, love you, beautiful meat sacks. Uh, you know, uh, they might have touched your body, but they couldn't fuck with your soul. Some powerful messages in today's Time Sucker updates. Uh, regarding all of this at the end of today's show. Uh, today's Time Suck is, is brought to you by, by a nice sponsor, by something very positive, by Marvelous Light. Time Sucker, cult of the curious member and author Paul Frank Spencer has written a book called Marvelous Light, a book about light as man has understood it for 3,000 years. What does the study of light 
through the various lens of modern physics, classical philosophy, various world religions tell us uh, that light is at the core of our universe, that it is the center of our reality. In marvelous light, the reader will encounter questions such as, does Einsteinian relativity give evidence of heaven? Was Plato one of the many philosophers to affirm that light expresses the necessity of a divine source for the universe? Was string theory's understanding of existence preempted by the Judeo-Christian and Hindu creation stories? Marvelous Light illustrates how some of history's most respected academic voices actually harmonize with many of history's most respected theologians. Marvelous Light by Paul Frank Spencer is available for purchase at all online retailers and can be ordered through your local bookstore. For more information, go to bygraceforglorylit.com, B-Y-G-R-A-C-E-F-O-R-G-L-O-R-Y-L-I-T. Dot com. Link in today's episode description. A uh, really impressive merging of theology, philosophy, and science. So check it out. Uh, thanks to all the new listeners who have been hopping over to Time Suck. If you're confused by some of the references, check out the character section on the Time Suck app or web, uh, website. Uh, I need to add some new character you know, bios, but a lot of them are on there. Don't want to go too heavy on inside jokes, but if I didn't have any, well, what kind of community would this be? What kind of fun clubhouse would this be? And this is a community now, the, the cult of the curious guessing, hoping. I had a blast in Salt Lake City this past weekend. All four stand-up shows uh, sold out in advance. As I record this, uh, the live Ant Hill Kids cult podcast was packing out, so hopefully that ended up being a, a really good time. Uh, more dates coming up fast. Going to be at the Star Dome in Birmingham, Alabama this week. Tomorrow, if you listen to uh, this episode when it first drops, Tuesday, February 26th. Atlanta sold out on the 27th. Uh, try to get more dates in Atlanta next time on through. Sorry about that. Uh, Going to be in Nashville the 28th, March 1st, March 2nd. Great uh, club there, Zanies. Thursday through Saturday, going to be in Huntsville, Alabama. Stand up live on March 3rd. Uh, come on out, aerospace employees. Then I'm off on a free cruise with Queen of Suck. Going to be on the Mediocre Time with Tom and Dan Cruise, March 7th through the 11th. Love having friends uh, who buy me a vacation. That's That's pretty sweet, pretty lucky. And then no more shows until Naples, Florida on March 28th. I'll be on a family vacation uh, later March 2. Uh, it's been a long time coming. And the Miami Improv, Saturday, March 30th. Sneaking in a college show on the 29th, but that show is closed to the public. Then Queen of the Suck, Lindsay's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, April 4th through 6th. Love uh, Pickwick and Frolic, Hilarities in Cleveland. Another live Ant Hill's Kids, uh, Ant Hill Kids Suck there on the 6th. Des Moines, Kansas City, Dallas, Houston, San Francisco coming up real quick. More dates at dancummins.tv. So many laughs and fun to be had. So many other time suckers and space lizards to meet. And got another funky product in the Time Suck store now. Time Suck pennant and a space lizard pennant. College sports team styles. Why? Because why not? Because pennants are fun and, you know, and they're full of joy. And if you don't, if you hate pennants, I guess maybe you hate fun. Uh, these pennants are hand-stitched, 9 inches by 27 inches in size, made out of 100% American-made wool felt also made out of 700% sea chicken underbelly skin. So it's waterproof, magical, capable of both laying eggs and short flights. The Time Suck pennant says Hail Nimrod, blue, white, yellow, and red. Space Lizard pennant says Space Lizards, makes sense. Green, white, yellow, and red. So let your suck flag fly, meat sacks. And now on to a topic. It kind of jumps off from last week's topic. Last week, we talked about uh, what should be done to violent sex offenders, pedophiles in particular. Uh, you will not find a more violent child sexual predator than Pedro Alonzo Lopez. All right, a little bit of context to lay down before we dive into today's timeline. Not a lot today, but important to take a look at what life was like in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Uh, Pedro's killing grounds when Pedro was raping and murdering at an unprecedented rate. Hopefully he is not still doing that now. It is possible. Uh, let's start by revisiting La Violencia. You remember that from the Pablo Escobar suck? Been quite a while since uh, that tale, so let's revisit it. Let's revisit the chaos that enveloped northwestern South America uh, around and after the birth of Pedro Lopez because La Violencia certainly affected the childhood of one of the world's worst serial killers uh, a great deal. La Violencia was a civil war in Colombia that lasted from 1948, the year Pedro Lopez was born, to 1958 between the Colombian Conservative Party, the Colombian Liberal Party, and various communist factions that uh, began to appear in the jungles of Colombia in the mid-20th century. Communism, Triple M, and Bojangles do not care for it. Uh, praise Bojangles. James Ingram, may he rest in peace, also doesn't care for it. 
Remember, he was also a fighter of communism. I've actually gotten a few emails telling me I shouldn't be so harsh on communism. I disagree. Communism, socialism's ugly big brother has, has never, ever worked for any length of time on a national level. Like, not ever. Despite the various evils of capitalism, capitalist nations have consistently provided a higher quality of life for the average person than communist nations. You keep forgetting that communism never, ever works. You keep forgetting humans need incentive to do their best. You keep forgetting that commie leaders abuse their power. You keep forgetting the wealth is never shared. Bum, 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 bum. Never distributed by the state. Bum, 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 bum. Who fucking does it? Michael McDonald communism parody. Me, kind of. That was all right. Uh, <laughs> that shit only works in theory. Why does communism consistently fail? Uh, it sounds great in theory, especially for the economically oppressed, right? Everybody works for the state and the state takes care of everybody. Hip, hip, hooray. Uh, why can't the ultra rich share with the poor? Why can't things be more fair? Well, for starters, this governmental concept doesn't recognize certain basic human truths. We're a competitive species. Most of us anyway, many of us have ambition and, and all men are not created equal. That's what doesn't work with, uh, with communism. That, that's not true. That notion of like, everybody should, you know, have this equal kind of situation, People aren't created equal. That's, that's some childish bullshit that sounded like a cool thing to say. Sounds fun. Oh, all men are created equal. No. Meat sacks are not equal. Uh, I hate that type of thinking. It's not logical. LeBron James had a much better, uh, had much better odds of becoming a professional athlete when he was born than I did, for example. I come from a gene pool of slow, unathletic men with chronically bad backs and hips. I feel lucky that I made it to 40 without a limp or an addiction to pain meds. Uh, does everyone run at the same speed? Nope. Jump equally? Uh, nope. Some people could train their whole lives to jump higher and barely ever get off the ground. Someone else could the same height, could never work out, dunk a basketball in jeans. We're created very unequally. Inequality doesn't end with physical attributes. Some people are smarter than other people. Uh, that's okay. Everyone has different talents. We should nourish whatever talents, you know, those may be. And almost everyone I've ever known works harder, uses their natural talents more effectively if they're given incentive. You know, you think we'd have the same caliber of professional athletes that we do today if they were all paid exactly the same? Fuck no. Steph Curry's, the LeBron James of the world, they're not going to be hiring the best nutritionists and trainers to continually improve their games year-round, some communist situation. People like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they're not going to work as hard as they have to create the technology they, they have created uh, if they were paid the same whether they worked 40 hours or 80 hours, right? I sure as hell wouldn't spend the hours in this podcast that I do if there was zero financial incentive to do my best. I would phone it the fuck in a lot of weeks. Right, if I got paid the same for stopping at 5 p.m. instead of uh, staying up till 2 or 3 or 4 a.m. sometimes, why? Why Why would anybody keep working? Or why would they work as hard or w work with as much passion? I don't know about you, but I live primarily on hope. Hope that if I work extra hard, I can improve my lot in life, do, coo uh, do cool things to help others. Even when it doesn't happen, it's fun to dream about the possibility of it happening. Right? It's fun, it's fun to think like, oh, man, maybe someday I could buy this truck. Maybe someday I could have this boat or I could start this charity. Or I could travel the world, do this or that. Because, you know, I was, I was careful with my money and I was able to save it in a capitalist system. Communism, it takes that away. It removes hope. It's the fucking death of hope. Uh, and I'm done now. I know this is not an episode about communism. I just wanted to explain why I've shit on it so much in so many episodes. I am in favor of certain socialist el elements, by the way, like a basic level of free he health care, free higher education for anyone who tests into college. And we do have, like I've said before, certain socialism uh, or elements of socialism already in this country as much as some people don't like to think so. Uh, I'd love to see a mix of socialist and capitalist elements, uh, you know, uh, you know, continue to, I guess, progress in, in health care and higher education where you could have free tuition to state schools for citizens who qualify academically to get in, uh, keep higher education accessible to the poor and middle class, private colleges for those who can afford it. Sure. Have, have at it. Uh, basic health care for citizens, private doctors and hospitals for those who can afford that. Again, sure. Have at it. Uh, there has to be some way to work all that out. Now I'm really done. Now I'm really done for reals. Back to Colombia. Civil War in Colombia began with the April 9th, 1948 assassination of the popular politician Jorge Gaitan, a Liberal Party candidate for the election in November of 1949. And this kicked off La Violencia. Colombia was caught in the middle of the Cold War between the United States and Russia at the time. A lot of speculation that both countries were tampering with this election. Russia wanted a communist friendly Colombian leader. The U.S. wanted anything but a commie. Gaitan's murder uh, provoked rioting. It lasted for hours and killed some 5,000 people. One of those 5,000 deaths would affect Pedro's childhood a great deal. La Violencia is estimated to have cost the lives of at least 200,000 people overall. 
Uh, La Violencia took place between the paramilitary forces of the Colombian Liberal Party, the Colombian Conservative Party, or, uh, which organized his armed self-defense groups and his guerrilla military units. Both also fought against the paramilitary forces of the Colombian Communist Party. Uh, the conflict caused millions to abandon their homes and property. A lack of public order and civil authority prevented victims from laying charges against perpetrators. It was chaos. There was already pervasive poverty in Colombia, and this just made things worse. Families were torn apart. Uh, the authorities weren't available to protect you. There was no stability. And it was this chaos and violence that Lopez was born into. Reminds me a little bit of Andre Chikatilo's origin. The butcher of Rostov, if you'll recall, was born in the wake of the Holodomor, uh, Ukrainian for to kill by starvation. Uh, that Stalin created famine in Soviet Ukraine in 1932 and 1933 that killed millions of Ukrainians, also known as the terror famine and famine genocide in Ukraine, sometimes referred to as the Great Famine or the Ukrainian Genocide. And Chikatilo was born in 1936 when starvation still occurred in the Ukraine in the wake of Holodomor. Uh, the poverty and violence of that disaster helped shape his childhood, just like the La Violencia helped shape Pedro Lopez's. And then uh, La Violencia transitioned directly into what's been titled the Colombian Conflict. Uh, the Colombian Conflict began in the late 50s, really getting going in 1964, and it's been a never-ending series of conflicts between various Colombian governments, numerous paramilitary groups, crime syndicates, far-left guerrilla fighters, and groups such as the Revolutionary Forces of Colombia and the National Liberation Army. It continues in some form to this day with a little flare-up here and uh, a little gunfight there. 220,000 people died in this conflict between 1958 and 2013, most of them civilians, uh, over 177,000 civilians, and more than 5 million civilians were forced from their homes between 1985 and 2002 in the wake of these conflicts, uh, generating the world's second largest population of internally displaced persons. A lot of crazy shit's been going on in Colombia for a long time. A lot of why uh, Pedro Lopez was able to get away with what he did is because of continual government instability. Uh, people were killed all the time in Colombia when Pedro was growing up. Life was cheap. Murders were routinely not investigated by a, you know, corrupt police force that were often in the pockets of some drug cartel or some paramilitary regime or, you know, following the uh, orders of some corrupt leader. There has been a, been a lot of fighting there for a long time. And of course, in times of war, who suffers the most? The poor. Uh, their lives are always valued the least. And things were similarly chaotic in nearby Peru and Ecuador. Uh, the other two nations Pedro would use as his sick hunting grounds. There were bloody political battles, horrendous economic inequality, territorial disputes. Uh, the maximum sentencing law in Ecuador of only 16 years that Pedro would receive for his crimes was actually born out of this chaos, out of some political chaos. That law was passed specifically to keep presidents who'd been put in jail due to political coups from being executed or permanently imprisoned on some trumped up charges handed out by the, the new government. In order to prevent more politicians from being wrongfully thrown in prison forever or executed, they got rid of capital punishment and reduced maximum sentencing. While much of Ecuador uh, actually uh, has been really or had really low murder rates uh, for years now, the jungles of the border areas between Ecuador and Colombia, where uh, Pedro would hunt, uh, and Ecuador and Peru has been fraught with violence and corruption for well over a century. The whole area is chaotic and, chaotic and remains so to this day. A territorial dispute between Ecuador and Peru lasted from 1821 to 1998. Yeah, went on for 177 years, damn near two centuries. The longest running international armed conflict in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, when South American colonies gained independence from Spain, Peru didn't like how the map looked. Q over 175 years of battle. Uh, hard to have effective law and order in an area when no one can even agree who the area belongs to. There are also a lot of different indigenous people living in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, many different tribes. Uh, Pedro Lopez would target, you know, the, the children of these, uh, these tribes specifically oftentimes. And, uh, and these tribes have been allowed for the most part, especially in the Amazonian jungle or, or up in the remote mountainous regions of the Andes to basically govern themselves. Uh, in Ecuador, where Lopez would first be caught for murder, almost a quarter of the population is indigenous, divided among 16 national, uh, nationalities across the Pacific coast, the Andes and the Amazon region. And the police, for the most part, just leave them alone. They just let them handle their own law enforcement. Uh, it's crazy, right? To think that that's how uh, parts of the world are still ran 
uh, my dad, my dad actually worked in Papua New Guinea on a remote construction site out in a remote. I know this is South Pacific. This is not uh, South America, but, but it just reminded me of, of how a nation can just let kind of indigenous people just govern themselves uh, and how that happens to this day. He said that tribes there still handle things themselves. Uh, a member of tribe A would be killed by tribe B. Uh, a council would be held. Sometimes a retribution killing would take place. Uh, my dad worked as a construction supervisor, basically out in the jungle. And some of his employees were members of these tribes. And my dad, <laughs> he actually almost got killed by one of them. Uh, he had to bounce off the island for a while. Had to bounce out to Australia while shit cooled off for a while. Uh, because a local tribe member uh, wanted him dead. They were looking for him. Uh, and knowing my hothead dad, I feel like he probably brought that shit on himself. Uh, if you think I can be a hothead, oh boy, I'm, I'm a much diluted form of the original rage machine, Papa Cummins. Um, also working in favor of Pedro not getting caught, especially when he abducted indigenous kids, is a racist class system in many parts of South America left over from Spanish colonialism. The governments of many of these nations historically just haven't been, uh, or haven't given a shit about the lives of indigenous people. Uh, the sex trafficking of indigenous people from these nations is still a major problem. Poor tribal youth leaving their mountain or jungle villages in search of a better life, uh, in search of some food for their bellies, stumble into Colombian, Peruvian, and Ecuadorian cities with zero job skills, looking for jobs. They end up begging on the streets. Many fall into or are physically forced into prostitution, child prostitution. Life for them is brutal. Uh, and this, this all made things easier for a monster like Pedro to do what he did. Easier to snatch a girl from an impoverished remote village that the police don't patrol or take a poor girl from a city center knowing the police won't investigate because there's no money in it for them. They have plenty of other problems to deal with already. Okay, now I, th now I think I've given enough context. The stage has been set for the creation of a sociopathic monster. Uh, let's get right into the life of Pedro Alonso Lopez, monster of the Andes with today's time slip timeline uh, right after a word from today's sponsor. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by the Political Action Committee Shadow Chikatilo for President in 2020. That's right. Uh, the ghost of Russian serial killer Andrei Chikatilo has thrown his hat in the proverbial political ring for the 2020 U.S. presidential race. What is big deal? So I'm not American citizen. Oh, so I'm not alive. So I have Shadow Shamecock. Uh, vote for Shadow Chikatilo 2020. Let us make America limp again. Let us burn freedom to ground. You know Russia control American uh, anyway. Uh, admit it. You know Putin, secret communist who pulls the rings. He is KGB for God's sake. If vote for Shadow Chikatilo, I promise not to wrestle to make it to death. Also make inside sweatpants jerk illegal. Uh, who never want for all people. I make all stabbing misdemeanor. I, I, I sure I think of other things. Shadow Chica till 2020, make America limp again. Now, of course, that's not a real sponsor. That's a fictitious version of a dead foreign murderer uh, who can't run for president from what I understand based on current political laws. Today's real sponsor is Indochino. Indochino is the world's most exciting made-to-measure menswear company. Uh, they make suits and shirts to your exact measurements for an unparalleled fit and comfort. Uh, do you like unparalleled fit and comfort? Well, then you, you will like Indochino. Guys love the wide selection of high-quality fabrics and colors to choose from, not to mention the option to personalize the details, including your lapel, lining, pockets, buttons, write in your own monogram. Simply make your selections, then hit submit and relax while your suit gets professionally tailored and mailed to you in a couple of weeks. I recently ordered uh, some custom-fitted chinos. It's a really cool system. When you create an account, you, you take all these different measurements and, and it's uh, really easy to figure out how to do it because they have these very well-made custom video tutorials that walk you through uh, how to do it very quickly. The, the Indochino website, very impressive. Uh, I'm amazed how many big companies have shitty websites. I know it's not easy uh, to create an awesome website, but if you have a full-time web department, make sure to crush it. Uh, I would love to have a full-time web department. Uh, anyway, Indochino, uh, they're on it. Uh, took my measurements. Now I have some some black chinos coming my way. I got to pick, uh, you know, if I wanted pleats or not. I got to pick side pockets or not. You know, if I wanted back pockets or not. I got to decide button color, hem type. Checked my order status, and they're being built for me right now. So, uh, you know, I will let you know uh, how it all worked out on a future episode. I'm very excited. Uh, this week, my listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $359 at Indochino.com when entering Time Suck at checkout. 
That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit. If you have ever shopped for a suit, you know this is a crazy good deal for a kick-ass suit. Like, really good. Plus, shipping is free. That's Indochino.com, promo code TIMESUCK for any premium suit. Just $359 and free shipping. Incredible deal for premium made to measure suit. Once you go custom, you don't go back. Link in the episode description, sponsor button in the TimeSuck app and on the TimeSuck website. Okay, now it's time for the timeline uh, of a man who does not ever get to have a custom suit or custom chinos. Unless the way they're customized is to maybe make them out of fucking nails and then hammer them in to his piece of shit meat sack skin. Let's get into the time sucker, Pedro Lopez. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Pedro Alonzo Lopez is born on October 8th, 1948 in Santa Isabel, Colombia, little mountain town of around 6,000 people today, nestled up in the Andes in the Tolima Department of Columbia. Departments in Colombia, uh, like states in America, are provinces in Canada. It's about 100 miles or 160 kilometers from the city of Medellin, home of Pablo's old Medellin drug cartel. I can't find any population stats for Santa Isabel uh, from 1948. But based on how many less people were in the area overall back then compared to now, I'm guessing somewhere around 1,000 people when Pedro was born. Very small town. Uh, Pedro was the seventh of 13 children born to a Colombian prostitute who seems to have worked as a prostitute since she was a child herself. His father, Ricardo Reyes, was a member of the Colombia Conservative Party, and he was killed in the initial rioting of La Violencia when Lopez's mother, uh, Benilda Lopez de, uh, de Castendia, uh, who was not Reyes's wife, was uh, just uh, three months pregnant with Pedro. She'd later say in an interview regarding his father's death, I thought I was going to lose him from the shock. But I could feel him inside of me. He was of strong blood. Now, this, of course, is the death I talked about earlier that would affect Pedro's childhood. Uh, since his dad was a, a customer of his mom and not actually in a relationship with her, there's a good chance Pedro would have grown up without a father regardless. However, uh, with his dad, you know, uh, being killed before he's even born, zero chance he's going to have a father in his life. Uh, in Colombia, prostitution is still legal in certain areas. And I know that because I Googled, is prostitution legal in Colombia? Adding to the horror of my recent internet search history. And my search history has been very rough recently. Between all of my pedophile Googling for last week's topic and now again this week, I, I have to be either on some sort of watch list if I wasn't already or I'm being more closely monitored. In just the last two weeks, between the pedophile island suck and, and this Pedro Lopez suck, I've Googled stuff like, how many kids are sex trafficked in Colombia? Can you cure pedophilia? Is it easy to get away with child prostitution in Colombia? Sex offenders, can they get out of jail easily? Child prostitution in South America, how pervasive is it? Which countries have the sexiest kids? What is the best way to lure the sexiest kids into your van? Is it illegal to pay cash for a van, then cover your license plate in duct tape, then hang outside of a playground with handcuffs and chloroform and a clown suit? I'm kidding about those last searches. That's so fucked up. No, uh, but it feels like I'm probably on the same list as anyone who has made those searches. Anyway. Prostitution, still legal in Colombia in certain zones and is common due to widespread poverty. Technically, it's only legal in certain neighborhoods or zones, like I said, but uh, uh, and only in designated brothels where sex workers are required to undergo regular STD checks. But that is that's just what's on the books. In reality, it's widespread around the nation and in and out of these zones. And child prostitution is so common that Colombia has become a popular destination spot for sex tourists looking for underage sex workers. Uh, Carol DeRoy, a spokesman for the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, said many child prostitutes were as young as nine years old and that clients were often middle-aged foreigners. Fucking gross. Uh, he also said these children were often addicted to drugs. But who knows if we can trust what, uh, what you know, Carol, or Carl, however you'd say his name, says about anything since he does work for the UN. So he's obviously an Illuminati puppet. It is insane how many people actually believe the UN's actually part of the Illuminati. Uh, just so you know, if there's any random pervs listening to this suck, just because you're a U.S. citizen and you head to Colombia to have sex with someone underage, you can still get in trouble uh, with the U.S. You can still go to United States prison. Many other nations have similar laws for their citizens. Uh, sadly, not enough of these sick fucks who travel to other nations to have sex with exploited children are caught. International sex trafficking is a huge problem, but they do get caught from time to time. So, so leave kids everywhere alone, dirty pervs. 
Sorry you got dealt a bad boner card, but if you can't control your urges, cut your fucking dick off or throw yourself off a cliff. Uh, the U.S. Justice Department formed the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, CEOS, in 1987 to help protect children, both domestically and abroad. CEOS attorneys work with the High Technology Investigative Unit of the Justice Department, the FBI, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations, United States attorneys' offices around the country, as well as with foreign governments and law enforcement personnel to investigate and prosecute Cases arising under federal statutes prohibiting the extraterritorial sexual exploitation of children. And if any of you listeners work uh, with or for the uh, CEOS, huge salute to you. Man, thank you for doing very important work and fighting the good fight. So anyway, we got young Lopez, born to a prostitute. Dad was a customer who died in La Violencia. The family was extremely impoverished. Despite all that, when he was a little tiny guy, Pedro seemed to be a good kid. Lopez's mother recalled young Pedro having dreams of being a teacher when he was a little fella, saying he liked to help the other children, and with his notebook, he helped the other children learn their vowels. Well, becoming a teacher would never happen for Pedro. Not really. He, he would teach some kids some crimes uh, later that we'll find out about in a bit. He'd teach some other kids how to die, and that was about it. Uh, Pedro hated what his mother did for work, not surprisingly. He would later say, all the children slept on a big bed behind a drawn curtain while our mother did her business with men. Now, without going into a big exploration of the moral implications of prostitution, some people think it's actually not always psychologically damaging or exploitive. Many think it is. A lot of different sociological theories regarding it either being necessary or horrible. Uh, I think we can all agree that hearing men pay your mother for sex and then use her like a piece of meat is probably, you know, less than ideal. Probably not as good as a stable home with firm boundaries and no early exposure to explicit sexuality. Uh, I doubt anyone on any side of the prostitution argument thinks Pedro's childhood exposure to uh, prostitution was healthy. I mean, can you imagine some random dude having sex with your mom in the same room that you sleep in? Only a curtain separating the sexual encounters and your ability to see it. You would hear everything. You would probably smell everything. Ah, some childhood that would be. How weird when you hit puberty. Right, trying to sneak in some masturbation while simultaneously trying to drown out the sound of someone having sex with your mother. My God! Oh, 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 okay. You know what that music means. Uh, we hear it a lot now when we start talking about prostitution. Bog, bog, playboy, bog, bog. Uh, comes to prostitution, you know my contribution, trying to create a space that's safe for sexual distribution. With the kids in the same room, is mama getting that zoom zoom? No, you got to separate the consummate from the propagate when you conjugate and procreate. You dig? You feel me? You catch what I'm throwing down. Keep your kitties away from them titties unless it's from Moe. The new beach, let's put them in a teddy unless you want the birds and the bees to teach and fly around for the wings even ready. There was even residents, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I had a hard time snapping out of that for a second. That was, uh, that was resident suck pimp uh, Chicken Joe's way of saying, even a pimp such as himself, thinks it's a terrible choice to make sexual business and parenting in, in, in the manner, uh, you know, to mix them in the manner Pedro Lopez was exposed to it. And, uh, and new listeners, Chicken Joe uh, first showed up in Suck 101, the Candyman episode, if you're curious. Okay. In addition, <laughs> uh, I've never, I've never like, I, I got it, that little, little uh, rhyme in there and I wanted just to stay in it for a while. I was having fun with that one. Okay. In addition to his mother exposing him to sexuality at an early age, Pedro would also later say that his mother was a violent woman and that when he wasn't listening to her have sex, she was beating him. Just like with Ed Kemper, uh, we have another killer with some mommy issues. His mother hearing Pedro's story is really getting my zapples riled up. Man, I can wish I could put her head on a stick. Ah. Mm, that's Ed Kemper. Uh, Pedro would later say, uh, that woman was violent. She would punish me with such violence. Okay, when, uh, when Pedro was five in, in 1954, his mother moved their family to nearby El Espanol, uh, a, a little city also in the Tolima Department of Colombia that now has about 60,000 people, known mostly for really good tamales and randomly for the manufacture of musical instruments like the tambora, a drum. Uh, as far as I can tell in Espanol, uh, they do not make air banjos, which brings us to our next sponsor. <laughs> Cramming a lot in right now. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you once again by Andrew Hole's internationally famous A-Hole Air Banjo Academy. The Academy's North American factory in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, is now giving tours so you can see exactly how air banjos are made. Experienced craftsmen use artesian air, 
much of it flown in from either northern New Zealand or the Quebec province of Canada, regions known for exceptionally musical air. Did you know that the air banjo is the perfect instrument to turn traditional Colombian salsa music uh, you know, into something much more. In, into, you can use it to put, a, put El Fuego into La Fiesta. Uh, check this out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just uh, I, I, all episode. I wish I just all episode. Of course, that's not a sponsor. That's another inside joke. God, started back in the drunkest fuck axman of New Orleans suck episode. I think around there, one hundred. Anyway, it's not the whole episode is not going to be this chaotic. I promise. When I I just when I heard that El Espanol was known for making musical instruments, I just ah uh, I had air banjo. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Okay. So no, uh, Pedro Lopez is. Oh, I I'm, I don't know why that pumps me up so much. That that might happen again later in the show. I can't make any promises. It's not planned, but I'm I'm feeling it in my soul right now. Pedro Lopez's mother, when she she did not work on tamales or instruments in Espanol, uh, she did continue to work as a prostitute. And 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 for the record, it took everything inside of me to not make a skin flute joke right there. I wanted to say that she did kind of get into music, polishing skin flutes, but I didn't. But I did just say it now. So. I guess I kind of did. 1957, when Lopez is eight years old, something that happened that caused him to leave home and have to fend for himself. Uh, exactly what happened is disputed. There was his version. There was his mother's version. Uh, excuse me. According to his mother, eight-year-old Lopez ran away from home one day and she searched desperately until nightfall. That night I cried and cried and I couldn't find him, she said, adding that she turned to a fortune teller for help finding her boy. Uh, has that ever worked, by the way? Has a fortune teller ever helped anyone find a missing person, even one time? One time uh, has that happened. Uh, very skeptical of fortune tellers. Uh, according to Lopez, his mom caught him fondling his younger, younger sister's breasts and evicted him from the family home. He said, my mother threw me out when I was eight after she caught me touching my sister's breasts. She took me to the edge of town, but I found my way home again. The next day, she took me on a bus and left me uh, off more than 200 miles from home. I was abandoned. Based on what he'd already witnessed in his childhood and who he'd become later, I, I don't doubt for a second that his mom caught him molesting his sister. I'm guessing w when you grow up in the household that he did, sexual boundaries and norms of what is sexually acceptable are going to get a wee bit confusing. I mean, you're hearing your mom have sex night after night. You, you know, you end up learning about what it is far younger than is healthy. Uh, it, it, look, it has to be looked at as very just casual. You're laying in a bed with numerous other siblings, all impoverished, uh, all, I'm guessing, uneducated, living in some poor, ragged little Colombian mountain town in a country full of corruption. Hard to get a good read in that environment on what's okay and what's not okay in general. And, and what if, you know, uh, like we learned as possible last week, what if you're born predisposed to pedophilia and, and then you start acting out sexually when you're eight? That's not good. That's not good at all. You know, and then there's no support system or, uh, or around you. It doesn't bode well for your future. Whether he was banished or he ran away, Lopez made his way to Bogota, Colombia's capital city, big crowded city of about 10 million people in the metro area today, about 1.5 million people back when Pedro lived among other children uh, who made up the lowest rung of the social ladder in that city. Pedro started smoking basuco, uh, a form of uh, low-grade cocaine that probably isn't good for any kid's mental development. I mean, my God, you know, he's already having a lot of trouble. He's on the streets of Bogota. Now he's smoking uh, basuco. I found a write-up about Bogota's ongoing basuco problem. I didn't. I don't remember hearing about this in any previous sucks. Uh, I found it in a 1987 Chicago Tribune article titled "Colombia Has Its Own Crack Crisis," and this is uh, the basuco problem. How it was described: it is a potent, toxic mixture of cocaine, brick dust, Jesus, cocaine, brick dust, chalk, and even volcanic ash, with residues of lead, sulfuric acid, ether chloroform, kerosene, or gasoline. 
my God, uh, drug addicts call it basuco because it is the crude extract or base from the cocoa leaf. Like crack sold in the United States, it is smokable cocaine. Unlike crack, it's, it's unrefined and unpurified, making it one of the most toxic drugs around. It is readily available on the street and is very cheap, less than a dollar for enough to make one cigarette. If injected, it can cause sudden death. Wow, man, lower than crack. That's saying something. When someone's like, hey, man, you want, you want to go smoke some crack? <laughs> Whoa, easy there, high roller. I can't, I can't afford crack. I can't afford crack. You know, smoke the shit out of some bazooka, though. A bazooka was legal. I wonder what the commercials would be like. Are you tired of the high price of crack? Tired of literally sucking dick for crack? Introducing bazooka. Less than a dollar a high. With just the change you can find under your couch cushions, you can smoke some bazooka. And melt your fucking face off. And it's kind of safe. Basuko is nearly as safe as bath salts and not quite as safe as huffing gasoline. Basuko. When you're tired of hearing, pass on my crack. Let me sound like that. A Dr. Camilo Uribe Gonzalez, former scientific director of Bogota's Clinic of Toxicology, described how brutal basuko is, saying, it's the most grave drug problem in the world. Crack is like chewing gum by comparison because crack has the effect of pure cocaine with no residual effect. Bazooka has a little cocaine and a lot of toxic substances. And that's what Pedro Lopez was smoking when he should have been a third grader. Uh, speaking about Bogota's street kid epidemic, Colombian criminal psychologist Alexandra de la Torre Yermio would later say, most of the kids left their house because they were abused. The only place they could end up was on the streets because they had no other options. Like other street kids, Lopez uh, stole clothing and food from dumpsters, joined a gang of other gamines, a name given to the throwaway kids who lived on the streets of Bogota uh, to have protection during the night as they slept. He learned how to fight with knives and belts for territory, food, and shelter. My God, smoking a basuco and then fighting with belts and knives when he's like eight, nine years old. When I was in third grade, I was still getting teary-eyed if someone said I ran funny at recess, which I did. I had a funny gait. My legs kicked out weird to the sides. Uh, I didn't know how to handle Mike Damon, sometimes kicking me in the shins. Uh, I really wanted him to, to stop was my best and only defense. Just stop it, please. These comedians would have eaten me alive. Uh, they still exist in Bogota today. I found, I found pictures of these kids on the streets and slums they lived in uh, in a 1979 article written by a woman working for the Irish Women's Political Association. Here's what Catherine O'Reilly had to say about the Gamines in 1979. She said, in Bogota, one sees the sickening contrast of the ultimate in opulence next door to the most desperate poverty. I speak of the slum dwellings on the slopes of the Andes restoration, which sprawl down the hillsides overlooking the city's northern shopping center. These dwellings are, dwellings are made from stolen bricks, cardboard, sheets of plastic, pieces of wood, and disused petrol drums, anything that substitutes for four walls. At any moment, the bulldozer can come, sent at a whim by a local landowner or government official. When the rains come, they are more often than not washed away. The children as young as six years old are sent out to the streets by their mother or father or whatever, where they compete with the vultures in their daily quest for food among the city's refuse bins. Ill-clad in their torn shirts and pants, often with no shoes, sometimes straw slippers, they form packs, sleeping on quiet streets and doorways, in local parks and under bridges. It is a well-known fact they can strip a car down to the chassis in five minutes flat. They are fast on their feet, so fast the police seldom catch them. More often than not, the police turn a blind eye. Girls of 13 become prostitutes, their faces reflecting the hopelessness of their lives. Even children earning a pound per week down the treacherous coal mines are considered lucky by comparison. To walk on the streets of Bogota wearing even a wristwatch is not just hazardous, it's crazy. The gamines would pull it off your arm, and if it didn't come, your wrist would be at stake. The same fate applies to handbags or any kind of jewelry. Uh, things were, by all accounts, I came across even worse for the Gamines uh, back in the 60s. Pedro's affiliation with one of these gangs uh, wouldn't be able to protect him from a violent sexual assault shortly after, uh, shortly after he arrived in Bogota. When he was begging for money on the street, an older man seemingly took pity on him and offered him warm meals and a warm place to stay. Pedro went with the man who didn't take him uh, to a home, but instead took him to an abandoned building where he repeatedly sodomized and tortured young Pedro until he'd uh, satisfied whatever dark urges possessed him to do that and then just tossed him back onto the street. Years later, Pedro would speak of this incident, saying, There I was found by a man who took me into an abandoned building and raped me over and over again. I decided then to do the same to as many young girls as possible. 
being a child, I lost my innocence. I have always wanted to punish those responsible. That's a fucking weird statement to make. Uh, I always find that like when these monsters are trying to rationalize their terrible behavior, they don't do a very logical job. Uh, what they say might somehow make sense to them, but it, but it makes no sense to anyone else on any kind of logic level. Like, let me get this straight. An older man raped you. So you want to punish those responsible, which would uh, be, if it was going to be anybody, older pedophilic men. Uh, but then you decide to rape little girls. Like, how does that pay the old men back? Uh, did some little girls hire the old man to rape you? Like, like he was clearly just using what happened to him as an excuse to rationalize the shit he had done when he was interviewed uh, to give that statement. Which I'm guessing he always probably wanted to do and wanted to do before that old man did that because that's why he was kicked out of his house in the first place. Uh, you know, probably probably easier to, to do these kind of heinous acts, I guess, if you're able to rationalize it as some fucking bent form of justified revenge. In late 1960, when Lopez turned 12, four years after living on the streets of Colombia, an older American couple took him in, gave him a room, food, and a chance to attend a local school for orphans. What should have been the start of a new life just turned into more of the same. Lopez was sexually assaulted again, this time by a teacher at the school the couple sent Pedro to, who had a thing for young boys. Unwilling to endure any more sexual torture at the hands of his elders, Lopez stole enough money from the school uh, to fund an escape and made it back to the streets of Bogota. Uh, I, I should add that these tales of early childhood rape come only from Pedro's later confessions. So we're trusting him to be honest about these encounters. Based on what he confessed to later, though, I, I, I don't think he was lying. Uh, he doesn't seem to be that guy. Uh, I am guessing the second rape further motivated him to hurt more young girls, right? That's, that's, that's the second old man who hurt me. I will have my revenge. Girls will pay. Wait, what? Don't, don't you mean men? The, the men will pay, right? No, don't you see? It's the girls who are behind it all. Girls hire the men to hurt the boys. It's always been that way. It's so obvious when you smoke the basuko. Uh, I wonder if his anger towards girls stemmed from that early incident of molesting his sister. That's what I think. Maybe he felt that if he hadn't gotten caught, he wouldn't have had to uh, fend for himself on the streets. Maybe he blamed her for that in some way, you know? Uh, rationalized his, uh, all his behavior as being his sister's fault somehow. In, in early 1961, 12-year-old Lopez returns home uh, to Bogota. He's, he's been fending for himself since he was eight. Hadn't gone to school for any length of time since he was eight. Didn't have any job skills. Still not even a teenager. His brain's fucked up from Basuco. And since Colombia's welfare system doesn't provide resources that are really re readily accessible to young people, uh, he returns to begging for food, soon establishes a reputation then as one of the most talented car thieves in the city. If you're keeping track now, this guy spent his first eight years sleeping in crowded beds in poor little Colombian towns, listening to his mom have sex with random customers, started molesting one of his sisters. Uh, now he's living on the streets of Bogota, where he's been sodomized by two different men. Hard childhood, man. Hard ch uh, does not excuse anything he would later do because plenty of other kids who had similar childhoods didn't go on to do what he did. But still, man, rough life. Uh, I, th I think the reason uh, there is, is, is far... Um, oh, sorry. I, I think there is far more interest, excuse me, couldn't read my own notes, far more interest in a, in a murderer like Bundy than there is in a monster like Lopez because, you know, like with Bundy or like with Dahmer uh, as well, they had pretty normal childhoods. No crazy abuse, no extreme poverty. You know, they weren't molested or raped. Uh, even Gary, you know, Green River Killer Ridgeway had a normal childhood by comparison. You know, sure, Mama Ridgeway probably got a little carried away with cleaning that bed wetter's wean, making sure he had a real clean wean, but, but way less tragic of a childhood than Lopez. Like, you read Lopez's story, and while it doesn't excuse anything he'd do, it, it just makes his crimes more understandable in a way. Like, I think, like, the, the fascination with, like, like, Bundy is like, why... Would someone who had a seemingly fairly normal childhood just fucking snap so hard and become so twisted? I think it's, it's harder to process mentally, but you read Lopez's story like, well, okay, yeah. I mean, don't agree with anything he did, but Jesus, surprised more people didn't become monsters who grew up like him. Uh, just, you know, the environment he grew up in just consistently placed no real value on human life or the innocence of children. Uh, for the next six years, Lopez would continue to steal cars and scrape a living off the street. Uh, if you raped or killed anyone during this period, we don't know about it. Pedro was paid well by the local chop shops. He was finally able to live out his dream of being a teacher of some sort, teaching other kids how to steal cars, which, which I'm sure actually did help them go hungry. Uh, sadly, teaching other kids to steal cars is probably the most noble thing Pedro ever did in his life. That's how you know you've led a really dark life. When somebody says, did you ever do anything good? Uh, yes, I, I teach kids to steal cars. I help children learn how to not be caught by police officers. I sort of give me the mentor for time. A uh, sort of street of Bogota camp counselor. The key to Carthay is just the right amount of basuko. Um, 
Eventually, Lopez got caught for stealing cars in 1967 at the age of 18. He's arrested, sentenced to two years in prison, and he's immediately raped again. Two days into his sentence, Lopez was gang raped by several other older inmates. Third time this guy's been raped now, this time by multiple assailants. And, and these rapes would lead to his first known murders. And the only murders were the victims were not little girls. Pedro knew if he didn't retaliate that more rapes would inevitably follow. So he took revenge on uh, two of those who were the most brutal, killing them in the weeks that followed with a makeshift knife. He'd made an axe that were, uh, you know, deemed or that he'd made four, four acts that were mostly deemed self-defense. Asked about it later, he said, I don't deny that I killed two in there, but the warden said, don't worry about it. Uh, but the, more, the warden must have cared a little bit because he did get two years added to his sentence, I guess one for each of these killings. Uh, he swore he would never again be seen as a victim. By this point, it, it feels like he's just pretty much destined to become a madman. 1971, 22-year-old Lopez uh, is released from prison. Uh, he's already a monster. He, he's uh, no longer just some car thief. He's the monster of the Andes. He caved into the rage he felt from being abandoned by his mother and from being sexually assaulted numerous times. And he allowed that rage combined with whatever twisted sexual attraction he had towards young girls to transform in, into an unprecedented kind of rapist, pedophile, killing monster. Uh, he blamed his mother for most of his problems. If she hadn't kicked him out, you know, he, he wouldn't have been raped. If she hadn't been a prostitute, he wouldn't have been sexualized so young. If she hadn't been abusive, he wouldn't feel so much rage inside. According to former FBI profiler Robert Ressler, serial killers very often have obsessions with some, of some kind with their mothers. A love-hate relationship in popular language. These moms usually aren't candidates for mother of the year, although they aren't necessarily abusive either. The common thread seems to be the sexual element. Mothers who were very seductive, who had many sex partners of which the son was aware. Of course, the children of prostitutes are more likely to be exposed to this type of behavior. So, yeah, so just numerous early childhood uh, environmental situations, uh, you know, gave this guy much higher odds to become what he was going to become than, than the average person. Sometime in 1971, 1972, Lopez set off on his sick quest just to kill as many kids as he could. He never stated uh, that that was his uh, kind of like mission statement explicitly, but it appears that's exactly what he did. He clearly had to have been fantasizing about sexual violence with children for a while when he was in prison for whatever reason, because when he, when he got out, he got right to it. Like we learned last week in the Pedophile Island Suck, we don't know exactly why people are attracted to what they're attracted to, but Lopez was admittedly attracted to little girls. One time when asked, like, you know, why, why uh, you know, little girls, uh, he said something to the effect of, you know, why eat old chicken when you can eat young chicken? I mean, this dude is just fucking beyond messed up. Uh, he wanted to kill him. Uh, he wanted to rape him. He wanted to control them and decide their fate. Going forward, Pedro now based his life around access to little girls in a way unlike any of the other killers we've covered. Almost. Uh, somewhat similar to Richard Ramirez. But his modus operandi would become remarkably consistent. Same exact type of victim. Always a young girl. Always kidnapping, rape, and strangulation. He, he made no attempt to lead a double life. He had no desire for a normal life, quote-unquote, like many of the serial killers we've discovered uh, or we've covered already. You know, like he wasn't a good dad when he wasn't killing women and children like BTK. Didn't have a family at home that he provided for like Chikatilo. Uh, didn't have a relationship with his mother uh, like Ed Kemper or Alexander Pashushko. Wasn't trying to publicly be seen as a good dude like Ted Bundy. Didn't have non-killing career aspirations like Charles Manson who wanted to be a musician or John Wayne Gacy who wanted to be a big wig in his community. Wasn't blatantly mentally ill like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, wanting to build that skull altar and have his sex zombies or, or Ed Gein with his nipple belts and skin suits. Lopez just wanted to kill lots and lots of little girls. Uh, rem yeah, again, reminiscent of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, you know, uh, just, just living off on pure evil id. Weird loner. Um, Ramirez just wanted to kind of eat candy, steal, rape, and kill. And I guess Lopez wanted to rape, kill, and just smoke Pasuko. Lopez knew he could steal and hustle to keep food in his belly. He didn't need a job to provide it for a stable life because he didn't care about getting married or starting a family. Didn't care about having friends. So in 1971 or 72, he sets out for Peru, the country he thought he would have the best chance of getting away with his crimes in. Uh, Pedro later admitted that during the next few years he spent in Peru, he stalked and murdered anywhere from tens to over 100 young girls from various native tribes and city centers across the region. He confessed to different numbers, uh, to different people. He also confessed to targeting young indigenous girls because they were the easiest to lead away from their parents. Uh, in addition to the indigenous girls, he also chose to punish the poorest of kids, uh, victims, uh, other victims of, you know, uh, the streets, other street kids, just like he was, kids who worked in open air markets by themselves with their gangs or with their parents. He'd later say, I went after my victims by walking among the markets, searching for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty. 
She would be a good girl working with her mother. I followed them sometimes for two or three days waiting for when she was left alone. I would give her a trinket like a hand mirror, then take her to the edge of town where I would promise a trinket for her mother. Uh, this trick was effective, especially since poor, hungry children would be easily lured by gifts and the promise of more. He would show himself by helping so the children would trust him. A criminal psychologist, Dr. Deramio, would later say, a uh, doctor who would later study him, uh, this doctor would also say then he would take them somewhere where if they would scream, they would not be heard. And he would repeat that pattern over and over and over again. The parents of the girls he took, usually between the ages of 8 and 12, uh, often had no idea what was going to happen to them. Some of their, their bodies have never been found. Took, it took years for other bodies to be found. They just vanished. Uh, I told her to go sell some things to buy a bus ticket to come home, said Mara Inde, the mother of one missing girl who never made it home. Other parents believe their beloved girls had been kidnapped into the sex trade, which actually sadly would have been a better fate. Desperate parents ran advertisements in local newspapers, often uh, offering rewards for information on their missing girls. The ads never turned up anything helpful. Uh, Pedro Lopez was very, very good at being very, very bad. It wasn't until after countless women and young girls had been murdered that uh, now 29-year-old Lopez was caught in 1978 by a tribe of Ayacucho Indians as he attempted to kidnap a nine-year-old tribal girl. The tribe members stripped him and tortured him for hours. Some reports say they beat him. Others say they actually flayed some of his skin off. All reports say they buried him up to his neck in the ground and poured syrup on his head so that giant South American ants would sting and eat him alive, a punishment they deemed suitable for his crime. This is a punishment these guys would actually carry on people. In the mountains of Peru, the uh, ombre asino ants grow up to three inches in length, have mandibles that allow them to gnaw their way through actual human bone. Uh, they usually have no interest in eating humans. Uh, they prefer sugar. Who doesn't love sugar? But they will eat flesh if it's easily accessible to them. Uh, the bodies of wild boars, spider monkeys, the occasional human have been found, uh, found stripped to their bones in the jungle. The ombre asino ants are venomous, and with enough bites, they can paralyze you. Uh, How would you like to go out that way, man? Hundreds of giant, aggressive ants just walking around your face, walking into your mouth as you're screaming, eating their way into your head through the soft tissue of your ear canal. Uh, some of you Southwestern uh, American suckers probably already know about these critters. There were some articles just last week about ombre asino ants showing up in Southwest Texas and in Arizona. Uh, six months ago, an elderly woman was found eaten alive. Jesus, eaten alive in her nursing home, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a room in a Brownsville, uh, Texas nursing home. My God, the ants had completely eaten her entire fucking head off. Not a trace remained, just a torso in a rocking chair. Uh, entomologists originally thought she might have been killed by a team of Roanoke recluse spiders, but then they realized that she was actually fake killed by a new fake creature I just made up in this fake ant, fake attack story uh, to give you more real nightmares. <laughs> There's no such thing as ombre asino ants. Uh, I, know, I, I know I got some of you. I know that your skin's crawling right now. God, I hope some of you are starting to worry about little ants just eating their way into your head. Anywho. Uh, Ayacucho Indians really did bury uh, Pedro Lopez up to his neck, pour syrup on him, and they actually did intend to have an ant of some kind eventually sting him to death or at least uh, torture him for a while until they decided to finish him off themselves or let him die of dehydration or exposure, you know, whatever. Unfortunately, this plan was interrupted. Lopez would have perished there, and many other young South American girls would have never died, but a female missionary convinced the tribe to turn Lopez into the police rather than go ahead with their planned lynching. And then, unfortunately, the police chose not to believe the Ayacucho witnesses, and they let Pedro go. Deported him to nearby Colombia. Rather than stay in Colombia, he just bounced over to Ecuador, where he again thought it would be easier to get away with murder. Once he made it to Ecuador, Lopez started killing as many as three girls a week, sometimes bouncing back into Ecuador, uh, Colombia, just kind of popping back over to the border in the jungle to take a few additional victims. For Lopez, watching his young victims die after he violated them was sexually more pleasurable than the physical release of raping them. He talked about this later in a prison interview, incredibly casually, like he's just talking about his favorite memory of playing football or something. Uh, he said, there is a wonderful moment, a divine moment, when I have, this guy is so fucked up, it's unbelievable. Uh, he says, there's a wonderful moment, a divine moment, when I have my hands around a young girl's throat, I look into her eyes, I see a certain light, a spark suddenly go out. Only those who kill know what I mean. The moment of death is enthralling and exciting. Just smiling as he says that. Man just truly did not give a single fuck about taking human life. Meant nothing to him. Never spoke of feelings of remorse or guilt. 
uh, about any of the killings, just talked about how much he loved it. Just, you know, openly admitted he truly enjoyed it. Complete sociopath, zero empathy, got 14 years, right? Wow, we'll talk about that later. My God. Some criminal psychologists who have studied Lopez speculate that since he felt, uh, never felt a sense of power as a child due to repeated violations from authority figures that he killed his victims in order to take some control back uh, in his life. He was no longer the victim, no longer the prey. He was the predator. He decided who felt pain now, right? He no longer took pain, he inflicted it. Some also think he was symbolically killing his mother over and over again, violently erasing one woman after another from the world. Girls who would never get to grow up and be the mother he had. Colombian criminal psychiatrist, Dr. Maria Helena Trujillo said of Lopez, one of the reasons he said he killed them was because they were poor. Maybe he tried to stamp out the weakness. This allowed him to feel stronger, bigger. There was a moment for him to be big. Man, echoes of uh, Chikatilo there. Lopez relished killing his victims so that he would, uh, uh, so much, he would wait until daylight to choke them to death. Even if he had kidnapped them in the evening the night before, because he wanted to watch the life leave their bodies. He's like a, it's, it's like he's a fucking caricature of evil. Uh, he'd also forced them to endure a night of terror before they died that morning. He later said, at sign of first light, I would get excited. I forced the girl into sex and put my hands around her throat. When the sun rose, I would strangle her. It was only good if I could see her eyes. I never killed anyone at night. It would have been wasted in the dark. The, 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 so, the composure the people at the prison had to have had to not just in a moment of weakness, pull out a gun mid quote like that and just shoot his fucking dick off and just let him die in some prison cell. While death was usually quick, some girls didn't immediately die and he was forced to continue strangling them after they regained consciousness. It took them between five and 50 minutes to die. He added, sometimes I had to kill them all over again. They never screamed because they didn't expect anything would happen. They were innocent. He lived for these kills. He, he was like a dude obsessed with hunting, but he hunted kids and he wasn't done with them uh, when they were dead either. After he killed his victims, Lopez would play with their bodies, but not sexually, not usually anyway. He, he would play with them like a, like a kid plays with dolls. He'd host imaginary tea parties, sit in a single mass grave with several bodies of his young victims propped up around him. He'd hold pretend conversations with them saying, my little friends like to have company. So maybe he's a little bit crazy like Ed Gein. Uh, I often put three or four girls in a single hole and talk to them. It was like having a party but after a while, because they couldn't move, I got bored and went looking for new girls. Dear God, man, this guy, this guy, Ed Kemper and Ed Gein would have, would have had the most evil, fucked up social club in history. Excuse me, just Pedro Lopez talking to the dead bodies, Ed Gein wearing their skin, Ed Kemper and his zapples doing all kinds of horrible stuff with their heads. Uh, police did notice missing persons reports were piling up, but like many brokenhearted parents, they believed the young girls had been the victims of sex trafficking and they failed to investigate the disappearances. Uh, sadly, girls disappeared from villages and families' homes all the time. One victim was selling newspapers when she encountered Lopez. Uh, he lured her away from the market, raped her, strangled her, covered her with newspapers to hide from passerby. Uh, sometime in 1979, Lopez snatched the daughter of a prominent baker in Ecuador, which uh, did draw some attention not only to her abduction, but to the uh, other missing girls as well, but not enough to lead any investigators to Lopez. Eventually, the baker's daughter's uh, body was found severely decomposed in an abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of town. It wasn't until April of 1980 when a flash flood in uh, Embato, Ecuador, unearthed the remains of four missing girls that police began to consider that something extra sinister was going on closer to home. While the bodies were so decomposed, it was impossible to determine their exact causes of death. It was clear that the young girls' bodies had been buried in order to hide evidence of foul play. Then a few days after the flood, a woman named Carvina Porvera uh, saw a strange man attempt to kidnap her 12-year-old daughter, Mar uh, Marie, while she and her daughter were at a local market. She screamed, causing shoppers to surround Lopez and pin him to the ground before he could flee with this girl. Lopez was rescued by police officers and arrested while proclaiming that he was a good person and that he had a clean heart. Don't arrest me. I have a clean heart. Uh -huh. uh, while in detention, Lopez was subjected to a standard interrogation until he told the policeman that he was not Ecuadorian, but a Colombian drifter. A police lieutenant then beat him and accused him of being part of a gang abducting girls from Ambato. The officer threatened to kill him if he didn't confess, but Lopez remained silent. I love this. I love that they won't give him a sentence of more than 16 years, but they will possibly beat them to death during an interrogation. Uh, and then a man named Captain Pastor Cordava Guadino was able to gain Lopez's trust. Sources seem to be split as far as how. There's two different versions of the story. Some sources say that Captain Cordova entered the room, told all the other policemen to leave, 
deciding to inter- interrogate the suspect himself with a more friendly approach. Uh, that he then offered Lopez food and cigarettes, asked him about his health and feelings before requesting information about the gang of abductors. Lopez shrugged, said he knew nothing about the gang. When the captain told him there was a, that he was under a lot of pressure from the families of the missing girls to find whoever abducted them, Lopez told him that he did know where one little girl's body was in a cabin outside of town. The police went to the cabin, found the nude dead body of uh, Ivana Nova Yacom uh, lying on an old mattress, a local missing girl. After finding this girl, Cordova asked Lopez how many other girls may be out there. Lopez looked upwards and said over 200 in Ecuador, some tens in Peru, and many more in Colombia. And then supposedly the president of Ecuador was informed and he ordered that Lopez should be taken to the pre- uh, places where he left the bodies until all the victims in Ecuador had been recovered. That's one story. Uh, another, maybe a little more popular and definitely, I think, kind of cooler story about how uh, Captain Guadino got him to confess is that Captain Guadino went undercover as a fellow inmate and shared a cell with Lopez for about a month. Gaining Lopez's trust, Guadino was able to get a confession uh, as well as details about the sites where victims were buried. Each story Lopez would tell Guadino would be more gruesome than the last, each revealing bone-chilling acts of inhuman degradation uh, that eventually the seasoned officer could no longer, you know, just uh, stand it and just blew his own cover. He just couldn't take any more stories. Uh, He also apparently got tired of worrying that Pedro was going to strangle him in his sleep like Pedro had strangled those young girls or maybe stab him with a shiv like he had stabbed those inmates who had raped him years earlier. Uh, Guadino, again, yeah, stayed with Pedro Lopez in that cell for about a month. Before he freed himself, by the time he revealed himself, Pedro had gleefully informed the undercover officer that he'd been traveling to Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia uh, for the past several years, and by his own count, had raped and killed over 300 young girls. Uh, Pedro Lopez, or as he came to be known, the monster of the Andes, uh, proclaimed proudly that he had raped and murdered over 110 young girls in Ecuador, at least 100 in Peru, and had put many more than 100, quote-unquote, in Colombia, in the ground, going on to state that he... Uh, only really enjoyed killing the girls in Ecuador, claiming their trusty nature made them more appealing, as opposed to the stranger wary little girls in Colombia and Peru. In his own words, in his own words, I like the girls in Ecuador. They are more gentle and trusting, more innocent. They are not suspicious of strangers like Colombian girls. And then, and then Lopez relished the media attention that came with his confessions. He started to talk to reporters about his own childhood, about the many ways society had failed him. Starts playing that blame game. Uh, reference his own tragic past, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, coldly declared, you know, the conditions that had created him. At one point, he specifically pinpointed the moment he had decided to become a serial killer saying, I lost my innocence at age eight. So I decided to do the same thing to as many young girls as I could. Okay. Doesn't really fit in uh, with what he was saying about want revenge on the men who attacked him earlier. Maybe this particular excuse is the truth, right? Maybe this is the reason he killed those girls. He lost his innocence when he was eight. And it didn't feel fair for others to keep theirs. I don't know. It sounds like bullshit to me, though, because he wasn't like killing like boys, right? I think I think he just was uh, wanted to somehow sound like he had a reason for his uh, horrific obsession just to rape and kill young girls. Uh, Pedro uh, used all of his murders to go on, on sort of an extended field trip with authorities. He offered to take them out to the grave sites to prove the truth of his claims. Uh, initially, they were hesitant, but local police. This is the you know the uh, the second version of the story. Initially, they were hesitant, but the local police decided to allow Lopez to guide them to the grave sites to provide families with closure. And then over the span of six weeks, Lopez led the police across 11 Ecuadorian provinces at each revealing yet another gruesome collection of bodies. For his own safety, the police required Lopez to dress as a police officer when he accompanied them uh, to the grave sites. There was a guard placed on either side of him, both for his protection and to thwart any attempt at escape. First grave site was just on the border of Ambato. He described the girl as a new, that newspaper seller we talked earlier. Uh, he told them he'd buried her under a specific bridge. To their surprise, the police found a complete skeleton, as described, at the base of the bridge. The medical examiner was unable to determine any specifics of the crime from the body other than a corroded arm and leg, evidence of torture he'd inflicted on the young child. Ugh. Uh, he never said exactly what he did. Uh, however, the police soon gained the, cl- uh, the clarity they sought after one of the victim's family members was brought to the site. They recognized the clothes. Hanging off the bones, the skeleton confirmed what Lopez had told them. The bones belonged to the young girl uh, that he, you know, mentioned. And uh, Lopez's claims were shockingly accurate. And uh, so then they trusted him to lead them to more and more bodies, which he did. Roughly two months after Hortensia, uh, this girl, Lopez, chose the wrong victim. Uh, oh, yeah, when he was actually in his... In his uh, Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, I think that was some kind of some, some leftover notes there. Uh, Pedro's Lopez, uh, Pedro Lopez's trip down memory lane would lead investigators to over 53 gravesites. At each gravesite, 
Lopez would display the exact same amount of amusement and satisfaction as if each grave marked a victory in his name. His pride was sickening. And yet the police had little choice but to follow him around and encourage him to take them to the next site. They desperately needed the information that only Lopez himself could give them, so they continued to supply him with cigarettes and alcohol in exchange for more information. Lopez began to develop a friendship with the captain he initially confessed to. He began to refer to the captain as father. Uh, finally, when the police began to realize that Lopez was now only leading them to older, compromised grave sites, uh, and that it would be harder and harder to identify any actual uh, victims they decided to bring him back to police headquarters where he was charged with 57 counts of murder. Uh, 53 from the grave sites he had led them to and then the four corpses discovered in those floods we mentioned earlier. Uh, it was Lopez's own detailed confessions that would lead him to being charged with 110 murders. Uh, Victor Lascano, at the time the head of the Ambato jail, told reporters that in his, in his personal opinion, the tally of 300 girls uh, that Lopez claimed to have murdered was likely a low estimate. Uh, and I know these numbers kind of bounce around a little bit because he, he would say different things to different people. So they hover around the same area, sometimes 300, sometimes 350. Um, Pedro Lopez only confessed to over, uh, Pedro, Pedro Lopez openly confessed to over 300 murders, calling himself worse than an animal, and yet he showed no sign of regret in his actions or words. His voice was calm, steady, and unemotional. Why did he confess to so many murders the police had no evidence for? Uh, was it just for the notoriety? Uh, I don't think so. Despite very little formal education and smoking all that basuco, uh, Pedro was not an idiot. He knew how uh, Ecuador's justice system worked and he knew how to manipulate it. Ecuador had and still has uh, some interesting sentencing laws, as we talked about earlier. No matter the nature or number of murders, the maximum conviction when Pedro was caught was 16 years. Didn't matter if he killed five people uh, or 500. 16 years, the longest sentence the court could hand down to you. By confessing to all of his crime, crimes after his initial arrest, even ones the police had no evidence for, Lopez was ensuring that he couldn't be tried again for future murders in Ecuador. He wanted to avoid double jeopardy. If he didn't confess to everything, then when he was released after the initial 16 years, he could be rearrested and thrown back, uh, you know, uh, for 16 more years for like another murder. And he just was making sure he could avoid that possibility. Um, and, th and then there's, you know, there's not, there's not uh, much to Pedro's story for the next 14 years. For the next 14 years, he's just in an Ecuadorian prison. Some say he was placed in solitary for the entire duration of his stay behind bars. Some say he was not. 14 years after his sentencing on August 31st, 1994, he's set free. His behavior in jail had been so exemplary that the monster of the Andes had his sentence reduced by two years for good behavior. A news crew recorded him leaving the prison. Ah, oh, man, if you were a member of that crew... Would, would you follow him? Would, would you be tempted to pull a Dexter and just snuff him the fuck out? Would you at least think about doing that? I, I wonder how many years somebody would have gotten for killing him. Uh, well, no one did. Lopez was given a bottle of water, some new shoes, a shirt and pants, a small amount of pesos, and a package of food, and then he was just set loose. He was still only 45 years old, still very physically healthy, a man with a lot of experience killing kids, no social ties to the outside world. Uh, luckily, Ecuadorian authorities did detain him about an hour uh, after his release. They discovered, uh, or Lopez discovered that the superintendent of the province had ordered him back into custody, claiming that he was now an illegal immigrant, which is pretty funny to me. Uh, he didn't have the proper documentation. <laughs> uh, the only logical step, therefore, was to hand him over to Colombian authorities, and the hope was that once on Colombian soil, Pedro Lopez would be forced to face the harsher laws of his native country, where he could be given much different punishments. But uh, about an hour after his arrival back into Colombia, Lopez was arrested, charged with the 20-year-old murder of Flora Sanchez, quickly processed and sent to Lima for prosecution. Uh, Sanchez's body had been found and identified by her mother. The pattern and methodology of this 20-year-old murder fit Lopez's previous methodology perfectly. Along with other evidence gathered by police, they had everything they needed to secure a conviction. But Lopez is a sneaky little fucker. Uh, he was able to benefit from a, another shitty criminal justice system. In 1995, he was declared mentally incompetent to stand trial on grounds of insanity and incarcerated in the psychiatric wing of a prison in Bogota, where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with an, with an antisocial personality disorder. I do believe that. Uh, he also started blaming Jorge Patino, an alternate personality, for the murders he'd taken complete credit for back in Ecuador. Now it's, now it's not him. Now it's, oh, damn it, Jorge. Want me to fucking do all this bad stuff? I'm just trying to... You know, smoke a little basuco, live a good life. Said Jorge made him do everything, convinced psychiatrists this was true. Uh, I don't believe it's true at all. Uh, three years later, Lopez was then declared sane uh, on evaluation by the prison psychiatrist, probably because he wasn't insane in the first place. 
Uh, I wonder if that prison psychiatrist in Bogota had just moved there from California. Maybe he was the same guy who declared serial killer Ed Kemper sane after that psychopath killed his grandparents to see what it felt like. 1998, Pedro was released in Colombia on the condition that he attend monthly sessions with the judge and continue to receive psychiatric treatment. He would do neither. Instead, he visited his now elderly mother, Benilda, uh, immediately after his release, asked her what she was going to give him, what he was going to get for his inheritance. She told Pedro that she was a very poor woman. I've seen her in interviews, and she looks extremely impoverished, uh, living in extreme poverty. She told him uh, her only possessions in the whole world were a chair and a bed. So he took those, took her chair, took her bed, placed them on the street with a little for sale sign, told her that if no one would buy them that day, he was going to set them on fucking fire. A woman did buy them, gave Pedro the money. Then he left, walked back into the countryside. He had once littered with the bodies of little girls, and no one has been able to locate him since. He could have easily changed his name, could have changed his look. For what it's worth, his superstitious mother, Benilda, thinks he is still alive. Uh, you know, she hasn't felt anything she believes would signify his passing. He'd be 70 years old right now if he is still alive. Law enforcement also thinks he may still be alive, or at least was back in 2002. In October of 2002, Interpol, the international criminal police organization, an international organization that facilitates international police cooperation, released a statement saying they suspected Lopez in another child's death. They think he is killed again in Espanol, or Espanol, Colombia. And that will take us out of today's Time Suck timeline right after a word from today's final sponsor. Another new one. Time Suck is brought to you today by Quip. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. Yet most of us don't do it properly. Quip uh, is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and even enjoyable with sensitive sonic vibrations, it's gentle on your sensitive gums. I like that because my dentist told me the last two times I've been brushing way too hard, been taking my frustration out on my gums apparently, and it makes your gums recede. If you do that, if you brush too hard, it can get you can ruin your own gums. Uh, the built-in two-minute timer pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides and guide you to uh, full and even clean. Uh, better yet, Quip doesn't require a clunky charger. Instead, it runs for three months on one charge. And it comes with a multi-use cover that you can mount to your mirror for less cluttered sink space. My quip is due to arrive in the mail today. I'm excited. Going to bring it on the road. I went with a slate metal look. Got a sharp looking brush. Going to keep my chomps clean with a little bit of style. Uh, quip toothbrushes are backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. And quip starts at just 25 bucks. If you go to getquip.com slash time suck. Right now, you get your first refile pack for free with the Quip Electric Toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash time suck. Link in the episode description. Button to take you straight to the deal in the Time Suck app and on the website. Scrub those chomps clean. Get those, get those chomps as clean as Mama Ridgeway with Scrub a Ween. And now we are out of today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So Pedro Lopez, scary, scary dude, man. Is he still out there? The mother of Maria Poveda, the Ecuadorian girl who was lucky enough to escape capture and help locate the, uh, or help lead to the initial arrest of Lopez for murder, has some thoughts about that. Uh, she says, it will be a kindness to the world for someone to murder this fiend. The monster of the Andes, won't last long on the outside. Maybe this is why we haven't heard of more missing girls. Perhaps someone, even the police in Colombia or Ecuador, have already killed him. If they have, I hope they made him suffer. Oh, me too, Maria. Me too. Hope she's right. Interpol might be wrong about that 2002 murder. You know, There haven't been a slew of other bodies fitting his old MO. So who knows? Maybe he got caught by another tribe. Maybe he fucked with the wrong villagers again. Maybe those uh, hombre asino ants are real. Maybe some uh, Ayacucho. Indians bury him uh, in, in the dirt up to his neck again for trying to take another girl. And those aggressive ants are chomping into his ears, slowly burrowing into his brain. Maybe he was still alive when they took the first chunks of his baruco, ruined dark mine, you know, back to their colony. Maybe it took him days to die. A little bit of, a little bit of payback for all the, the harm he caused. You know, thinking about him uh, getting eaten by ants makes you want to celebrate a little bit. Bang, dun, 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 dun. Let the ants eat him! Eaten by ants! Get him, get him! Yeah! Yeah! Before we
we get into the final thoughts I have on Lopez, uh, let's see what the internet thinks, because why not on today's Idiots of the Internet? Idiots of the Internet. I just heard a bunch of footsteps upstairs, by the way, from my upstairs neighbors here at the Suck Dungeon in the, in the business complex. <laughs> I'm just imagining what they're thinking today. Just weird screams, and every once in a while, just some, like, plucking noises and a Reba scream. <laughs> For today's comments, I looked under a video titled, uh, Pedro Lopez, Serial Killer Files Number 6, uploaded by Rob Gavigan on January 15, 2015. 816,000 views. User, 100 points and do-over, shows a lack of understanding when it comes to the diversity of Hispanic cultures. When, he, uh, when they post, his name is so Mexican, it is unreal. <laughs> and then uh, Viva Iskander posts, uh, which should have gotten more than one like, when she posts, he's not Mexican, though. Uh, exactly. He's Colombian, you silly goose. You know, that's kind of, you know, an entirely different nation. Um, similar to talking about like, uh, like how American an Australian's name is while talking about, uh, how he thinks Pedro, uh, became a psychopath user. Fred sounds like one himself with his use of the word harlot. <laughs> this guy posts, if it wasn't for his unsympathetic mother, the dumb harlot who abandoned him to the streets at age eight, he wouldn't have had a psychological disorder that made him a serial killer. His mother, the cruel harlot is the first to blame for making her child suffer that severe abuse that led him to become a psychopathic murderer. What the fuck are you talking about, Fred? You don't know anything about psychology. A, cr a cruel, dumb harlot. Who uses, who says harlot? Psychopath. I picture Fred, you know, writing this as he has a prostitute tied up in the basement just next to him. Not so fun now, is it, harlot? Look who couldn't keep their legs closed, harlot. You dumb, cruel harlot. You wanted to dance with the devil. Now's your chance. I kill you for God, harlot. Now the neighbors are really fucking scared upstairs. I feel like Fred doesn't understand how hard life could be for a woman in the third world impoverished economy. Maybe she never had access to birth control. Maybe she was forced into prostitution when she was very young. What about all the fathers? Where were they? Why didn't they stick around? If she's the cause of all this, why didn't his siblings also turn into murderers? If she was a terrible mom, why didn't she abandon all of her kids? Maybe Pedro was a bad seed. Maybe he had a lot of evil nature in him. Maybe he was born evil. Uh, Deuce ex machina... Uh, probably pronounced that, I don't know, it's a YouTube name, uh, leaves a comment that enrages another user, posting, I actually feel only pity for this man. He was raped and molested wherever he went and often saw no justice being done against the perpetrators. Had he grown up in the right environments, he may have never developed into the monster that he became, which I, which I don't disagree with. He may have never uh, you know, turned into that. I don't have pity. Uh, I don't only feel pity though for what he did. Uh, neither does Merrick Gravina. Merrick Gravina not letting this shit slide. Holy shit, are they not letting it slide. They post, do X Machina. This is the worst comment I have ever seen. What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, poor guy. He was molested, so it doesn't matter. He did worse things to 300 little girls. Holy shit. Maybe you are as degenerate as he is. That's why you feel pity for him. I would gladly beat the shit out of you and more happily torture the fuck out of that monster. I love that Merrick also gets included in the beating. <laughs> I, I want to kill this monster and beat the shit out of you for posting that. Uh, user, Ursula Forrester, makes a nice Napoleon Dynamite callback, posting, how about we don't vote for Pedro? Uh, you either get that one or you don't. User Eric XL posts, it would be okay if he had just been released after 20 years, but this guy promised that he would continue if he ever got out, and no one kept an eye on him after release. First off, uh, <laughs> I will say, Eric, Rob Gavigan seems to have gotten several facts wrong in his presentation of Lopez in this video. Lopez did not serve 20 years. He served 14 years. Uh, uh, also not sure where he found information that Pedro said he would just keep doing it. I don't, I didn't find that in any of my research that he promised to keep doing that. And how does Eric think it would be okay to let this guy out after 20 years, as long as, as long as he, what promised to not do it anymore. Like you could trust the word of someone who's admitted to killing hundreds of kids. Like that's, that's their system. Now you admit to killing over 300 kids, right? Uh, yes. And you know, that's fucked up, right? Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> I was confused before, but now I get it. Uh, good. Okay. So you promise you're not gonna do it again? Oh yes, I I will never do it again. Pinky promise. I will never do it again. Cross your heart and hope to die. Yes, I cross heart. I hope to die. I never do it. What are you gonna do when you get out? I want to get the job. I want to be a good person. I keep to myself. I I smoke a bazooka. I cannot afford the crack, but I can get all the bazooka was need to not kill kids. Bazooka. I think that's enough for today. Idiot.
All right, last Lopez thought. Sorry if my voice sounded different today, by the way. Had a hell of a head cold just getting over. Uh, amazing what one can rationalize, isn't it? Uh, when this piece of shit talked about what he'd done with investigators with the press, it's just no, zero shame, no remorse, just proud of his kills, spoke of killing girls as if he was uh, some noted baseball player talking about his you know, favorite home runs. Love the attention, big grin, lots of laughs. Acted, he acted like a celebrity winning an award instead of a criminal arrested for murder. Uh, he also claimed he was helping his victims, said he was strangling them, so they would go to heaven and not suffer in this world. He also once said, I am like a God. I give life and I can take it away. And he said, I'm the man of the century. No one will ever forget me. Uh, yeah, you won't be forgotten, Pedro, but being forgotten is way better than being remembered for being one of the worst piece of shits of all time. I've never understood people who seem to think that any attention at all is better than no attention. You ever, you ever been to a bookstore? You ever checked out Netflix? You ever walked through a beautiful park or swam off a scenic beach? There's a lot of things to do in life that are fantastic that never get you noticed or remembered, but are super fun and enjoyable and worthwhile. Uh, I, I don't care how I'm going to be remembered uh, when I'm dead. Not really. I, I hope I can influence others to do some good things with their lives, but I'm not going to really care because I won't be here. Uh, don't worry about being, you know, how you're going to be remembered or if you're going to be remembered long after you're gone. Worry about how you're valued now when you're alive. Worry about doing something meaningful, not something memorable. You know, if it ends up being meaningful and memorable, fucking great. Bonus. Uh, now let's take a few looks at the memorable uh, and also extremely despicable de deeds of a man I, I hope someday uh, has his life violently taken, if it hasn't happened already, in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Pedro Alonso Lopez was born on October 8th, 1948 in the little uh, village of Santa Isabel, Colombia. He'd be kicked out of his home for molesting his sister when he was eight, spent the majority of his childhood living on the streets of Bogota, fighting at a gang of other kids, stealing cars, and smoking some of that a bazooka. Number two, Pedro Lopez would be raped three different times growing up uh, by the age of 18, once by a stranger who promised him food and shelter, once by a teacher, once by prison inmates after being thrown in jail for stealing cars. He would kill two of them the only man he is known to have ever murdered. Number three, in 1980, Pedro confessed to killing 110 girls in Ecuador. He led police to 53 different bodies after his arrest. He sentenced to 16 years in prison, serves 14. Number four, immediately after his release from an Ecuadorian prison, Pedro was tried again for murder, this time in Colombia, where he's declared mentally incompetent to stand trial on grounds of insanity and incarcerated in the psychiatric wing of a prison in Bogota, where he would be declared sane and released three years later in 1998. And he may still be alive and free today. Number five, new info. In 2012, in uh, Tunja, the capital of the Colombian department of uh, Bojaca, a girl was killed in the way Pedro had killed so many other girls. Details of the murder were similar enough to Pedro's crimes that the Colombian weekly news show, Cronicas RCN, hinted that Pedro Alonso Lopez may be responsible. Is he still out there? Hopefully proof, proof of his death comes soon. Until then, who knows? Time suck. Top five takeaways. Pedro Lopez has been sucked. Another dirty, dirty deed bag. Uh, deed bag? Another dirty, dirty dirt bag uh, to throw into that, uh, you know, fuck that meat sack pile. Uh, unbelievable how people can rationalize the most heinous of acts. Just so you know, Bojangles is down in South America right now looking for that son of a bitch and hoping to bite his dick off and then bury him up to his neck in an anthill. Uh, thank you to the Time Suck team. Uh, thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velocamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, uh, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck, High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bitelixer. Meeting them, uh, just met them the other day. Well, I'm meeting them today as I record this. Uh, change Your Brain, Axis Apparel, Thanks to this episode's researchers, the Lily Twins, Sarah and Rebecca Reba. Uh, the Hammers of Knowledge. I got to meet them and meet their parents in Philadelphia after one of my shows last week. Such a great family. They're so good. A couple of young, curious meat sacks with great futures ahead of them. I feel pretty confident about that. Now, have you joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group? Well over 7,000 time suckers in that group now on Facebook and, and uh, well over 1,500 Discord members uh, in the Discord group. Link to the Discord chat room messaging app right on the Time Suck app. Links to the private Facebook group and the Discord channel in today's episode description. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the Unabomber. Finally, all hail the space lizards for voting that topic in. Been waiting to suck Ted for about two years now. Going to be a fascinating suck, I'm sure. 
The Unabomber is the nickname given to American domestic terrorist Theodore John Kaczynski, a.k.a. Ted Kaczynski, who conducted a 17-year series of attacks using mail bombs to target academics, business executives, and others. The Unabomber bombing campaign, which killed three people and injured 23, started in the late 1970s, continued until Kaczynski was caught in 1996, following a nationwide manhunt led by the FBI. His capture marked the end of the FBI's longest and most expensive manhunt. And, judging from the sound of his name, he may be Polish. So, probably a lot of slander coming to our Polish monster meat sacks. Time now for today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Important update about Pedophile Island coming in from Time Sucker Carl Murray. Saying, hello, Master Sucker. I was listening to the Pedophile Island Suck and noticed something that wasn't accurate. When you were talking about Earl Shriner's assault on a seven-year-old boy, you said he was left for dead and and did die. He actually lived through that horrific ordeal. I actually went to the same elementary school as Ryan, the boy he assaulted. And I lived down the street from the wooded area where this took place. Wow, I did not know him well, but do remember seeing him come back to school afterwards. My God. According to my research, he died in a vehicular accident in 2005. Just wanted to let you know, since this hit so close to home, I remember being a third grade boy who was afraid to go anywhere alone for months. Sorry for the long message. Oh, not long at all. And uh, thank you for the info. And keep on sucking. Hail Nimrod, uh, Cult of the Curious member, Carl Murray. Yeah, thank you for that. I I remember being confused by the wording in that. And uh, I felt like it was a coin toss and I couldn't get to like the exact verification I wanted. It was written to me in a way that suggested that he died. But I guess maybe I just read into left in the woods to die. Not did die. So thank you very much. That's a, that's a great correction. Uh, update regarding the private, privatization. That's a tough word for my brain. Uh, regarding the privatization of prisons uh, by private prison employee in Time Sucker Jake, who writes in, and I was talking about that in that pedophile island where I, you know, I was concerned about privatizing prisons. Uh, Jake writes, hail suck master, sack full of meat. The suck kingdom comes, I suck we done. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Forgive us this day our sucker update and those who it may trigger. Oh, man. Okay, enough of that. First off, I would prefer it if you didn't use my last name. Yep, take that. And this is read on the podcast. I wanted to address your concerns about the private prison industry holding these types of civil commitment centers. First off, I do work for a private prison company and have the luxury of being paid to travel to our various cities all across the U.S. I've been in both government-run and privately operated facilities. I've also worked for both sectors. I say this because you, to show you where any bias might come from, but I've been in corrections for quite a long time, and I've attempted to remain as objective as possible. My first question is, if you are okay with the government holding people outside of the prison sentence, why then does it become not okay when the private industry is being paid to do the same? My concern there, I, I can't address my thoughts there, is uh, profit. My concern is that it becomes uh, a conflict of interest if, when profit is on the line, if it is profitable to hold people, uh, you know, in in the prison, more profitable than letting them go, to me that creates just a dangerous conflict of interest where it is in the best interest of the committee to not let these people out. But I might also un- misunderstand how the committees are run and the committees that uh, decide if they're going to be let out or not might not have any private influence. But that's that's why – that's where my concern comes from. Um, does it not raise the same question of constitution- constitutionality? It does. Man, and, and right now, my sinus is so full of cold that it's even harder for my mush mouth. So that's why I'm struggling extra. Uh, I can assure you we do not go and watch the government agencies which contract us consistently visit and audit our procedures, and we audit ourselves and our processes on a nearly endless basis. It is actually in our best interest to do better than the government agencies who contract with us can. If we don't do better, why would they pay us? We report everything that happens in our facilities. Some of our clients, government agencies, tell us we report too much but that it is because of the scrutiny we are under at all times. When I worked for one of our clients, I witnessed several occasions of cruelty, neglect, and outright abuse that was covered up because of someone's tenure. But with the private industry, I've seen people in high-ranking positions with 15-plus years with the company being fired because, because they failed to report an incident. This is because our liability is so much higher in the private industry, and we have everything to lose if we do not maintain our clientele and our professionalism. Are there some incidents that are bad? Of course there are. We deal with the same challenges our government counterparts do, but the spotlight will fall on us at least three times more because we are in the private industry. We are just people trying to make a living with a company who can pay us better and provide better benefits than our government counterparts. That's all I will go into. I will gladly provide more info for you if you ever have questions. Thank you for reading. I've already bought tickets to your Indianapolis show in September. Can't wait to see you live. Keep on sucking. 
Uh, P- Jake, P.S. Maybe bring Pootie and Juju back every once in a while. I will. I, I they, they come back. They're, they're still in there. They're still in the uh, in the suck world. Man, thank you. That was that was a that was a very well worded update, Jake. Uh, a lot of information. Yeah, I guess I you know I wasn't thinking about uh, the oversights that the that the private sector would have. Didn't realize that they were more stringent than public. So I guess as long as we keep those laws in place, then then I don't have a problem. You know, as long as the scrutiny is the same. Uh, sounds like even better. So thank you. Uh, pronunciation update coming in from Kim Malone. Kim writes, <laughs> again with the mispronouncing of the word penitentiary. It does not have a U in it. You have pronounced it as penitentiary. Oh, every time I've heard you say it. I've said this in before, <laughs> but please stop. LOL. In one suck, you said it so many times that I thought maybe it was me saying it wrong. So I listened to a, <laughs> I listened to a pronunciation guide. I'm not wrong. See you in Atlanta. Hail Nimrod. Keep on sucking. Thank you, Kim. Penitentiary. Pen- penitentiary. I got, now I got to look it up. I got to look up some phonetic spelling on this one. Thank you for sending that in. Uh, time sucker Bill Wicks had a hilarious message regarding last week's episode. Uh, Bill wrote, Dan, 12 minutes into the pedophile suck, and I'm definitely not ready to dish out some vigilante justice. I would assuredly not welcome your help in tracking down and castrating pedophiles and stapling their assholes to their foreheads still attached. I most certainly would not seek your assistance in dropping these pieces of shit Bound and gagged into some exceptionally rapey, big dick only prison. (laughs) All of these things are illegal and frowned upon by our lizard overlords who definitely aren't reading our messages. Keep on sucking. That's fucking great, Bill. Thank you, man. Thank you for sending that in. I got some of you last week with my horrific Pat Sajak character assassination based on nothing true whatsoever. I need to probably never do something like that again. It's terrible. Uh, But sucker Eric Grant wrote in saying, God damn it, Dan. I started Googling Pat Sajak immediately. You got me. I normally take pride in not getting sucked, but holy shit, good move doing it right off the bat. Keep on sucking. I, I try to keep you guys off balance. I know, but that, that, was, that one I felt a little guilty about. It was so terrible. Uh, and now for some powerful messages uh, from those affected by sexual abuse. Pedophile Island message uh, from Tim, Time Sucker Carrie, leaving last name out on purpose, who wrote in with the fantastic subject line of Pat Sajak hooked up with your mom's friend, Paula. Nice callback. Uh, Carrie writes, hey, Dan. Of course, that subject line is nonsense. Just trying to get your attention. My apologies. Not needed. Uh, Though it was difficult to get through due to constant crying and pausing to become physically ill, I want to thank you for tackling the too often avoided subject of pedophilia. It is a goddamn epidemic, and most people seem to be looking the other way. My wife and I found out a year and a half ago that my father had been, oh man, this is so brutal. Found out that my father had been molesting our oldest daughter since 2014 when she was only 11 years old. Since our daughter came forward, five other women have come to us saying that he abused them too. Uh, Some as far back as the mid-1960s. As as a protective father of four girls, you can imagine how how hard this has caused me to be on myself. Not being the most mentally stable fella in the first place, I have been to some very dark places on this journey. A fan of the Rizzuto show, I only found time suck in your stand-up in December. Your comedy has been a vital escape for me in times that I wasn't sure I could go on. You may think I'm being ridiculous, but I truly believe you have saved my life, and I cannot thank you enough. Carrie, Carrie, man, I can't imagine. Cannot imagine how tough that would be. I mean, my God, the double whammy of the victim and perpetrator both being very close family members. Um, man, thanks for, thanks for you know, uh, protecting, protecting your daughter, you know, for, for doing the right thing and, and standing by her and, and making sure that, you know, your dad is prosecuted. That cannot be easy. Hope you're getting some uh, good therapy. Hope the whole family is. And uh, sorry you had to have somebody like that in, in the tree, man. But uh, no reflection on you. Absolutely none. Thanks for being a great meat sack and a great dad. Time sucker Katie has sent in a powerful message regarding overcoming the guilt of being victimized. Uh, got a lot of these messages. And thank you, everyone, for sending these in. Choosing to read this one. Uh, Katie writes, how your fiery hatred of sexual predators helped me come forward with my abuse. That's the subject line. Hey, Dan, I've been wanting to write you about this for a long time. And after the Pedophile Island episode, I felt like it was a good time to tell you how much you've helped me overcome years of manipulation and come forward with my own sexual abuse. It may sound weird, but stay with me. My story is that I was sexually abused by my sister's husband on three different occasions between the ages of 14 and 16. It wasn't just touching. The man manipulated the fuck out of me. And had it continued, he would have raped me. I have no doubt in my mind. Uh, I did not come forward with it until I was 21. My brother reported it to the police for me. That's a whole other story. My family is fucked up. And it was such a difficult decision for me to press charges. And the day he was arrested was the worst day of my life because it, I felt so guilty, me, for ruining his life. I honestly felt so sorry for him that I almost dropped the charges. All of that because of how deeply I was manipulated. 
Okay, now for the part where I explain how you helped me. Before the police were involved, I honestly just didn't realize the scope of the situation, and I didn't think it was worth making a big deal about it, and I felt like it was my fault. At the time, there were several sucks where you were able to express how you feel about predators. The way you spoke about them and didn't hold back helped the wheels start turning. I started realizing how messed up my situation was and how I needed to do something about it and fight for myself. After I pressed charges, I specifically remember your angry rant about David Koresh, and it was what made me realize how manipulated I had been, and it was like a light bulb went off in my brain. It made me snap out of it and realize that my abuser is a sick fuck and deserves to rot in jail, that there is no redemption from that, and that those people deserve a hell of a lot more than a slap on the wrist. It helped me so much to hear a normal person's viewpoint on predators. I don't know how normal I am. But uh, I'm glad I helped. I, I was, I was, it was like I finally had the right voice in the back of my head telling me how it really is. I don't know if any of this makes sense. It does. But I just wanted you to know that sharing your passionate hatred of injustice and scumbags helps someone finally break the cycle of manipulation and gain an accurate perspective of what happened to them. I honestly think there needs to be more angry rhetoric about predators because to talk about them any other way is doing a great disservice to their victims. But that's just one person's opinion, one that I agree with. Thanks for being an angry bastard. I hope it makes you happy to know that it positively affected at least one person. Sorry this was a bit long-winded. I'm so excited to see you in the Salt Lake City, Utah this weekend. Um, this will be this past week. Yeah, absolutely. And I will be at your Saturday early show. We're pumped to see you perform for a second time. Thank you. Uh, your loyal time sucker, Katie. P.S. After charges were pressed, six other women came forward. Two or three of them are his cousins. He is currently awaiting sentencing after pleading guilty to four counts of child sex abuse. I'm blanking on the exact charge and one count of lewd act with a minor. Each is a felony charge of one to 15 years in prison. I'm told the judge overseeing the case in Utah does not put up with that shit. So we're hoping he passes down a harsh sentence. Hail Nimrod, me too. Me too. I hope he is kept away from other potential victims uh, for the rest of his life. Because somebody who does that, like he does, as we learned, probably not going to stop. And um, we got another one, another perspective on all of this. Uh, actually, you know what? Uh, we're going to do two more, two more updates. Sorry, I had to scroll ahead there. This was from Rebecca Jade. Uh, Rebecca writes, I was, I was referred to time suck by an ex-boyfriend and for a long time refused to listen to you because I didn't want to prove him right. I'm glad I got drunk one night and listened to you anyway because that motherfucker was right. You're hilarious and dark as fuck and I love it. Anyway, to the point, pedophile island. I have always had a fascination in all things macabre and maybe that's why I'm so good at my job. I register sex offenders. Wow. Uh, not it's not glamorous, obviously, but somebody's got to do it. I try to get as many locked up as I can because, frankly, there is no cure. And fuck those guys for hurting kids. While listening to you go through the stats about sex offenders, my blood began to boil. Not because you said anything wrong, but because the truth is so much more terrifying than anybody realizes. Even when sex abuse crimes are reported, it is fairly common for the charges to be pled down to a lesser offense. For example, a locally known predator here has been charged multiple times with aggravated sexual assault of a child, all but one of the charges have been dismissed, and it was pled down to injury to a child, which means he does not have to register as a sex offender. I think it's because of the laziness of the attorneys not wanting to go to court with a difficult case. But to be fair, I don't have any stats to back that up. One time, an attorney told me he dismissed a charge on one of my offenders for failing to register because he was just confused. This offender was actually recorded telling me to go fuck myself because he didn't want to register anymore. Shortly after he was released, he then tried to kidnap a teenager from a convenience store. Surprise, surprise. The courts dismissed that as well. God damn it. And he is out there roaming the streets again. Well, now you got my blood boiling. That's fucked up. This is just one of the many, many stories I have. I mean, shit. Look at all the white guys let off uh, on serious charges because the judges don't want to ruin the pervert's life. Knowing full well the pervert in question completely altered the life of all of his or her victims. But I digress. I think the moral of the story is keep an eye on your kids and trust nobody. As you stated, most sexual offenses are committed by someone you know. Stranger danger just is not as prevalent as you would think. Most importantly, talk to your children. Monitor their social media and their phones, as this is now the common way to groom a child. Good point. Trust your child when they uh, don't want to be around somebody. Mm -hmm. Also, something not everyone is aware of, the National Sex Offender Public Website, NSOPW. This will link you to your state's registry, and you can do a search by name or location and see all registered sex offenders in your area. The NSOPW also offers resources on education and prevention, which is just so, so important. Sorry if I'm telling you things you already know. No, this is important to share. I just wanted people to uh, do everything they can to keep their kids safe. Hopefully Bojangles, in his infinite wisdom, can rip the testicle off each motherfucker who has raped anyone. Thanks for everyone thing you do. Keep on sucking. Hail Nimrod. Thank you, Rebecca. Awesome info. Yes, the problem is much deeper than people are aware of. 
Most people, uh, and yes, use the registry. Lindsay and I keep track of perverts in our area. We use it. Sadly, there are several around the suck dungeon due to the dungeon being located near some transitional housing. And yes, I have often fantasized about the possibility of getting away with murdering them, uh, which Lindsay does not care for because she's afraid of me going to prison for that. I, uh, you know, if I could just figure out how to confidently get away with it, I might very much enjoy going full Dexter on those motherfuckers. And finally, an important update from Anthony McAndrew that is uh, leading us to our next charity donation. He writes, Dear Master Sucker, I listen to Time Suck every week. I just finished this week's Suck on Pedophile Island. Wanted to tell you about a group called Bikers Against Child Abuse. They are a group of volunteers that are bikers who protect, protect children that are victims of abuse. I am sending the link to their website. It might be something worth saying in an update to give people in need uh, a resource. Keep sucking. Yes, thanks, Anthony. I have seen these guys actually. A local chapter uh, was part of a 4th of July parade this last summer here in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley also interviewed some local members of this organization when he was working at Rock 94 and a half in Spokane, FM station there, and says uh, they would help transport sexually abused kids to court and show up in the courtroom and mean mug the abuser. Let him know, we see you, motherfucker. We know who you are. We know what you've done. I love the intimidation factor. Uh, their mission statement is Bikers Against Child Abuse is a nonprofit tax-exempt organization that provides that exists to provide aid, comfort, safety, and support for children who have been sexually, physically, and emotionally abused. We are dedicated to the principle that one of the basic rights of childhood is to be safe and protected, and when the child's family or environment have failed them, we stand ready to provide it to them. Uh, Bikers Against Child Abuse is a strong organization of dedicated individuals who are willing to sacrifice any and all in order to protect and secure a child's basic right to a happy childhood. And it looks like based on current Patreon subscriptions, we're going to be able to donate over $1,600 to them this next month in March to help them do what they do. Fuck dirty pervs. Hail Nimrod. Everyone else may Lucifina uh, find those pervs and, and torture them in Nimrod's butthole in life after this. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for today, Meat Sacks. Enjoy those penance. Uh, don't wander into the mountains and kill any girls this week. If you do, I hope those uh, ombre asino ants are real and eat your fucking head off. Uh, for all of you not getting eaten by ants, uh, stick around after this little outro for some joy for a moment if you want. And uh, after that, you know, keep on sucking. <laughs> Full 